So we were uh, talking about the Damascus document. By the way, uh, Christina, how's that going? They sent me the they sent me the proofs of the first twelve chapters back. They're breathing down my neck. How those three or four weeks after that we're working on that? Oh, good, good, good. Well, is uh, probably overwhelmed since she's leaving this weekend to go to uh, go to uh, that conference in San Antonio. But hopefully, it doesn't work out. Well, nobody ever. It must be a midget that uses this lectern. <laughs> document is like the one of the people who first saw this document were overwhelmed <coughs> and amazed by it. Remember I told you the story of it? It was first found in Cairo. The British had gotten control of this area after they, you know, basically uh, bought the Suez Canal from the French who had dug it in the 1860s and then the British somehow got control of the whole country. I don't remember what the actual historical process is, but 1880s, they had control of Egypt. And then under their administration, I guess curiosity was more pronounced. And uh, sooner or later, someone went into this uh, Geniza. Uh, and this, what looks like a, probably was an old Karaite synagogue in Cairo. And uh, so they saw this document. And uh, now, you know, I told you the whole dispute over the scrolls, and uh, basically we, um, we um, organized it around requesting the parallels to this document. Why request the parallels from K4? What's K4 mean, by the way? Fourth manuscript bearing cave discovered. So why, uh, you know, why uh, ask for the parallels? To see if the, if the document is the same there as you know, the, the copy of the Cairo Geniza would be a thousand years later. Because those were documents from the 1200s. How do we know? Because of the letters and contracts and everything else that was in there. Uh, you know, uh, someone's done an actual um, overview of the materials in the Geniza and calls it Mediterranean society because of the view of the whole Mediterranean trading world that is reflected in the correspondence and everything in the materials in that Geniza. Geniza means a place that you deposit, repository, secret, really it means secret, but where you put old materials that you don't know what to do with, you're going to bury or you're going to throw away, but you don't want to throw them in the garbage pail. You don't want the FBI looking in your trash or something, you know, uh, but you also can't destroy certain things because they're prayer books or things of that kind. So, um, we had the man of scoffing, line 114, arrive. Uh, and somewhat like the New Testament gospel presentation of Jesus' events, they often quote a scriptural passage. So here the scriptural passage, like a straying heifer did Israel stray from the prophet Hosea. That would be line 14, and um, so it doesn't, it's out of context, it doesn't say a lot, but you can see a preacher using these sort of quotes to reinforce his uh, presentation, sermon, whatever he was giving. So they wanted us to attract this waste, the, 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 the man of scoffing line arose who poured over Israel the waters of lying. So we know later on other documents we're going to get this liar, this man of lying or spouter of lying. And spouting will be used, the same root in Hebrew as pouring. So we can tell it's the same parallel type of imagery. It's probably the same imagery. And what he did was caused the people to wander astray, to track this waste with no way no way in the wilderness. 
of John the Baptist-like way. And brought low the everlasting heights, abolishing the pathways of righteousness. The pathways of righteousness are clearly supposed to be the Mosaic law. Removing the boundary markers which the first, the ancestors, the forefathers had laid out or marked out as their inheritance. And for this reason, the curses of the covenant were uh, brought down upon them, God's vengeance, and he delivered them up to the avenging sword of vengeance of the covenant. That's pretty tough stuff. These are not very peaceful-minded people, even in illusions of that kind, right? These are like, these people are, um, you know, this is almost Bin Laden stuff. <laughs> and the people who are doing this are the seekers <coughs> after smooth things, the, 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 the people who uh, look for loopholes, choose the fair neck, meaning probably, as I say in my parentheses, the easiest way. And normally, because we have that expression in other documents that we'll see, particularly the Nahum commentary, commentary on the prophet Nahum, we think that that relates to uh, the Pharisees. But in my work, Maccabees, Zadokites, Christians, and Qumran, that you also have in this book here, uh, I've often, I say that it can also be Pauline Christians. To know that, you have to understand something about the history of Christianity, and I've given you a bit of it, but suffice it to say that there, as if you study it carefully, most religious people don't, but if you're an academic, you try to. There are two parties, one observing the law of Moses in the early church, one not. So it's the same situation, really. And the party uh, that's not observing the law of Moses is the party we're familiar with party that won out in the struggle for Christian history, the Paul part. Say, so, well, I thought all well, this is Jesus. Well, we don't know about Jesus, and uh, the, the point I try to make in my work on that subject is we have to find Jesus somewhere in this argument between James and Paul. You know, he's somewhere in the middle of this. And you have to find, uh, find out, because James is the law part. But it looks like from the early documents, and even Acts is forced to agree in the end but, uh, on that point, that James is in control in Jerusalem. And uh, Paul in Galatians, in chapter 2, if you want to uh, convince yourself of this, admits that the representative of James are the powerful people in the church. And that what they are demanding or saying, and Paul doesn't agree with them, uh, that goes. And even Peter has to hove to a James line. And that's all in Galatians chapter 2. If you want to convince yourself of that, you can read it. If you don't need to convince yourself of it, if you believe me, then you can depend on what I say is there. Uh, I didn't know any of that material was there until I was around 35, 40 years old when I came here and started teaching these courses. No one had ever taught me, and even any college course or graduate course that I ever took about such things. So don't feel bad. Uh, you know, I just learned about it by through my teaching in these kinds of courses. I, I, when I read that in Galatians, I, I tell you, I couldn't believe what I was reading. It's so, anybody, person of faith, not faith, believer, not a believer, insider, outsider, it's just a mind-blowing uh, presentation of the situation in the early church. How many have read that? It is pretty uh, incredible material. And um, it's obviously historical. It's extremely original. And very few people could have dreamed such a conflict of. And uh, Paul gets so angry that he calls Peter and Barnabas hypocrites. Uh, he uses the actual word hypocrisy. And, and, and they would no longer walk with him. They withdrew from him. And then he goes on the rest of Galatians to uh, a long, you can call it a sermon, a homily, Others who are not of his mindset would call it an harangue on why the law brings death and why you don't need to observe the law and why you shouldn't circumcise and all kinds of other things, which in fact have become the standard doctrine of Christianity as we know it. 
but that clearly wasn't the doctrine of the of the reigning party at the time he launched into that harangue. Say, well, you see, Paul knows Jesus better. Well, we can't, does he? You mean the people closest to him walked around with him or with him his whole lifetime and didn't understand the meaning of his message? If we can speak about his message, and someone who never knew him, never saw him, knew it, understood it better than they? That defies all logic to my mind. Now, a person of faith doesn't worry about logic. But uh, to my mind, then you, it's not a provable thing that Paul knew Jesus better. What is, uh, in the academic view of things, that the material in the gospel is written retrospectively after the fact from a Pauline viewpoint, and therefore Jesus is presented as being Pauline. That doesn't tell me anything about the historical Jesus, and that's the whole, whole problem that scholars have been wrestling with for 150 years. Who and what is the historical Jesus, and nobody in the academic world has ever come to any consensus on that. And I, they're not liable. Because a lot depends on where you start. They have a Jesus seminar that, uh, that goes on, and they take votes about what parts of the Gospels are true or false. That's uh, about what it's come down to. But uh, that's no way to decide what's accurate. You can't take a vote on what's accurate. You know, uh, I think that's what happened in the original <coughs> composition of the traditional Bibles anyway. It's the yeah. same thing. Sure, they took that. They only voted on what they thought was going to be true throughout lots of scripture. But I think the materials were already circulating by that point. They took a vote on what to include and what not to include. But they hadn't written the materials, those people who took the vote. Uh, that vote would have been taken in 300 AD under people like Eusebius and Constantine. And I frankly wouldn't trust anything you see as a Constantine said about anything. So uh, that that doesn't even that doesn't even doesn't, that doesn't help me as an historian. Uh, but uh, whoever wrote the documents, I'm trying to say, presented a Jesus that was largely Paul. Now maybe that's the way Jesus was. Well, then those closest to him certainly missed something. And uh, you know, it's like. I write a book three. I write a book a hundred years later about John F. Kennedy, which is totally different than what Robert F. Kennedy thinks about John F. Kennedy. I write it from the point of view of Nixon. <laughs> That's what we're dealing with, and uh, everyone likes Nixon's point of view, and therefore everyone believes that's what the original Jesus said. But to my point of view, Robert F. Kennedy knew his brother better than Nixon knew. Because these people are inveterably opposed. So anyway, what I'm getting down to is that this could, secret have to smooth things, can also relate to Pauline Christians. Why I'm saying that is that a lot of people don't even know there is such a thing as a Pauline Christian. I think the original researchers in the scrolls never even thought of such things. You read Cross, you read Millick, they don't even know there's a difference between Jamesian Christians and so they, when they say, oh, these documents are Christian, they think that, oh, well, these don't look Christian, so they're not Christian. <laughs> no, they're not Pauline Christian. But they don't even get that far in their in their criticism. Of the, the, you, know, you need to have a lot. Cross is a very decent fellow at Harvard and everything, but he's an Old Testament scholar, and he does Canaanite literature. That's his speciality. He doesn't know anything or doesn't care about the history of the church. DeVoe and Millick certainly wouldn't want to admit there was a problem anyway. I told you, I think, if I didn't, I'll tell you again. In the 5th century, the famous Augustine, who was in North Africa, wrote Jerome a letter and said, he just read Galatians like I'm telling you about. He said, uh, Jerome was living in Palestine in Bethlehem and he was collecting the uh, vulgar, Vulgate Bible as we know it. Old and New Testaments, and he was uh, in Latin, and, and he was sort of living in a hermit cell in Bethlehem. And he got the letter, I think, after a year or two, and answered him in th into three years or something. But we have the correspondence, and uh, Jerome said, You know, uh, I can't believe that Paul has the temerity to call the saintly and good, uh, go godly Peter a hypocrite. How does, he, uh, how does he dare say that about our Peter? And uh, Jerome, uh, after about as I said, three years of hesitation or delay or whatever, finally writes him back and said, look, uh, more or less this is what he answers. Some things are best not inquired into. And uh, that's about as far as anyone's ever gotten since. 
uh, you know, no one's ever within the church organization, I would say. Because Jerome really speaks for the official church. Jerome is a very important figure. I mean, he's the one who decided that uh, the brothers of Jesus were cousins, not brothers. You know how he decided that? Oh, he decided that because there's one notice in the Gospel of John about Mary, the wife of Clopas, who was, I think, witnessing either the crucifixion or the resurrection or so on. And um, she has four sons, the name of Jesus' brothers, basically. So Mary and Clopas, Clopas has these four sons. And John calls her Mary, the sister of the mother of God, or something like that. In other words, he doesn't even name Mary as Jesus' mother. For him, in effect, it's hard to come to the post, we don't look at the Gospels that closely. Jesus' mother doesn't even have a name, or is unnamed. Mary, the mother of God, or Mary, the mother of Christ, or whatever. Uh, pardon me. <laughs> the mother of, of Jesus, or the mother of Christ. But she has a sister called Mary, who's married to this Clovis, who has the children. They said, oh, well, that that's, means that they're cousins of Jesus. <laughs> yeah, the problem is that, you know, Mary couldn't really probably have had a sister called Mary. So the whole thing has been totally fudged anyway. And um, what has happened in my book, I try to point out, that as the doctrine of the supernatural Christ developed in the second century, mainly, fathers turned into uncles because God became the father, and this Clophus turns out to be an uncle of Jesus. Fathers turn into uncles. Um, brothers turn into cousins. Mothers turn into their own sisters, and so on. Because these people were puzzled. It isn't that they were mean or being, uh, you know, purposefully obscured. They didn't know what to make of these materials. But once they had the idea that Jesus is the Son of God, then all these other relationships had to be pushed over. And so the documents became modified accordingly. Anyway, I don't mean to try to convince you that you have to do a lot of thinking about that yourself, but the point of the matter is, I'm just trying to show you how important Jerome is, because even in Catholicism today, you hear that these are cousins of Jesus, and they get that from Jerome, but no one ever thought of that before the 5th century. And Jerome gets it from this one odd notice in John, which is probably has to do with the distancing of Jesus' uh, brothers from him. That is, Mary is the mother, but then she's not the mother of God anymore. Anyway, I'm sure it's, maybe you don't think it's preposterous, but to my way of thinking, Mary, the sister of Mary, Mary, the sister of her own sister Mary, is a contradiction almost in terms. I suppose there are some families where you have two, John, the sister of the brother of John, but I've rarely come across one. Herod, Herod's kids. Well, they're, they're not, they're not. Stepkids. No, 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 they're, no, 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 the name Herod is just a, a title I see. There's no people with the same name. Because like Josephus shows that that with his different wives, some of the doesn't matter. They're all different names. Herod is just a, 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 it's like Caesar. Herod Antipas, Herod Philip, Herod, you know, Archelaus. That's just the title. They're they're trying to say they're like Caesar. Anyway, we're off the subject, and I can't uh, continue because I got to get moving. I'd like to do this, but that's a whole course I do called Christian Origins. Uh, and another course called the Historical Jesus. Um, in any case, I, this seeking smooth things goes from, it certainly has to do with the Pharisees because of the seeking I told you last time of Halachot. And these people are saying, no, 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 no. That's making, you know, that's, that's not, that's cheating if you like. You can't look for traditions. You have to stick to the legal letter of the law as it's written. And then, of course, you have the Pauline Christians who basically deny the law or don't think it's binding or are not prepared to follow it. And that seems also, to my mind, to be implied here, but that's just me at the moment. 
that's not a, um, a widespread necessarily point of view. Uh, what they do these is that they justify the wicked and condemn the righteous. And the words are actually based on the ZDK, which is the word for <coughs> righteousness, justice. Uh, <coughs> Spelling material, and the other one is evil. Uh, Rasha ah in Hebrew is evil. Put an A in here. This is this is a this is a letter of Hebrew, and in Arabic, and in Greek. It's a rough breathing letter. <clears throat> These Semitic languages think that. Um, You know, a oh boy, that up uh, is actually a consonant. So I don't try to think of something you may have heard of that would be, oh, like you talk about the Kaaba, not the Kaaba, but the Kaaba, or the, or the Quran, the Quran. The, 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 those are breathing sounds, but those are actually letters in, 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 in Hebrew and Arabic. There's lots of them, um, you know, uh, I, I can't think offhand of. You'll, you'll bump into them when you see newspaper articles uh, of this letter in Hebrew and Arabic. It's called an ayin. And it's ah, 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 ah. That's, that, that's the sound it is. Um, and then there's an aleph, which is higher up in the throat. Uh, 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 not as deep down. I know it's confusing. But they have two k's, too. They have a k, a regular k, and then a nasalized k. That's the one that's transcribed as a q. You want to put that garbage pan away from there? We'll close the door because there'll be a lot of people in the hallway at the moment, so might as well just uh, close the door. Now. So um, we um, so these letters have in Hebrew, for instance, you have a T Z and a Z, a T and a Z, and that sometimes. So this is really a T Z, and like Nazarite. Is really a Z, but note stream Christian is a TZ, and uh, I think Nazareth is a TZ. So uh, sometimes these things get confusing. You know, I, I think that sometimes they're they're mixing up some of these letters in transcription into Greek. Anyway. We will go on because in Greek they don't have all that. So, sadok, which is a tz, which is a tz, <coughs> would be a um, an s in Greek. But it isn't an s, and that's not. The, so you get saduk in the Greek or sadusis. So you're not getting the precision in the Greek transcription. If all as it goes into a different language, all these subtleties are lost. And. Um, that he should be called a Nazarite, and uh, means he goes to live in Nazareth, but the two words are different in Hebrew. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think there's some confusion probably going on. I think that uh, the Dead Sea Scroll community is really a community of Nazarites. And a Nazarite is someone who's a dedicated person, and you may know from Scripture or elsewhere, that a Nazarite is someone who uh, dedicates himself and takes a Nazarite oath. And I think that's what the early Christians were doing in Palestine. Samson is, for instance, presented as a Nazarite, even though he's he's kind of a joke on a Nazarite, because he's not controlled at all. He's totally uncontrolled, and he does everything that a Nazarite wouldn't do. He loses control of himself. <laughs> so someone who wrote the Samson story is actually sort of making, sort of making fun of Nazarite. But anyway, all this is um, got to a literary criticism. Let's go on. They justified the wicked, made justify in the actual Hebrew, and I have it and you can look at it, line 19 in the Hebrew, you can look at it, is based on the same ZDK root. So they, and it really means in Hebrew and Arabic, there's a form of verb called the causative, that you cause something to happen, you make something happen. So that's a causative verb form. We don't have it in English. And uh, that, these languages are built up quite rationally. Anyway, it means to make someone righteous. Justify, we say in English, is to make someone righteous. 
For instance, at one point in Genesis, it says Abraham's faith was counted for him as righteousness. When Paul translates that in his letters, he says Abraham was justified by his faith. But that's not what the Old Testament says. It says his faith was counted for him as righteousness. But when you go into Greek, it becomes justified. So uh, and then you get the whole argument in Christianity, justification by faith, justification by works, stuff like that. So, uh, these are very subtle differences. So here's one here. He, he justified the wicked, which is Russia on him. But condemn is also based on the word Russia. <coughs> Make evil. Consider someone evil. Condemn them. That's not the language. It's very primitive in a way. Hebrew doesn't have a lot of vocabulary. It's very uh, small vocabulary. Maybe has a, a, a sixth of the vocabulary of English or something. And Arabic, which has a very vast vocabulary. Um, and uh, it turns out oral languages have a vast vocabulary. But languages that have been reduced to writing early on actually become more constricted. There's not as much creativity in the vocabulary. So actually it turns out Hebrew is not a primitive language. It's actually probably highly developed and that it was written early on and then it became you know, much more Arabic instead of that. Oh, that's because it's primitive. No, the opposite. Arabic's the primitive language because it was reduced to writing a long time after it was spoken. So it's got a vaster vocabulary. English has got a vaster vocabulary. Because it came through many different languages. Anyway, so here is the wrong way. These people make the wicked righteous. What does the New Testament have Jesus say? I say, have Jesus say, because I'm not yet, what, I, I, until you can convince me that Jesus actually said these things, I'll say that he's pictured as saying these things. Because if, it's, uh, if, uh, if I see the same thing in Paul, and I don't see it in someone like James or someone, then I'm not sure Jesus said it. So, he's, it has Jesus say, one lost sinner is worth 99 righteous ones. There's a famous parable about that in the gospel. Well, uh, that's justifying the sinner or the wicked. And condemning, if you like, the righteous. So I don't think that, well certainly the Dead Sea Scrolls are totally against that position. Now we like that position. It attracts, it appeals to us. We like thinking, oh, I'm a, just a sinner. And we got the Salvation Army people out there beating the drum down in the, where the drunks are and all the poor people are saving the souls of sinners because of those kinds of passages in the, uh, in the gospel presentation of Jesus. But often they forget the righteous. And as you see, often the righteous are looked askance on in some of the parables and those. And particularly that, that one lost sinner is worth 99 righteous. Well, the scrolls would be 99 righteous ones. That's what they think of themselves as, righteous. Maybe, in your mind, they are worth 99 righteous ones. I mean, frankly, um, I don't think, uh, you know, Tupac Shapur or whatever his name is, uh, is worth 99 righteous ones. It's not my cup of tea if you think that way. I don't think Chuck Colson is worth 99 righteous ones. You know, man, that righteous one is powerful stuff. If you're really a righteous one, it means you've been living your whole life in righteousness. Uh, I think that's also in Galatians. Paul says at one point when he's arguing with Peter and Barnabas about the met, that met the, the people from James, he says uh, something like, "And we are all Gentile sinners." <coughs> So basically, well, that saving a sinner is saving a Gentile. You say, well, see how nasty the Jews are? They all thought Gentiles were sinners. And then Paul has this whole doctrine of born in sin, you know, from Adam and Eve. Uh, and the whole story, and then he, thinks, so he tells that in Romans, and he gets to that. And now we, well, we have this whole thing that everyone's born in sin. Oh, no, no, that's not the Old Testament approach. You're not born in sin if you're born under the covenant. You're only born in sin if you're not in the covenant out of the covenant. So he's directly aiming that at people 
outside of the covenant. We are all Gentile sinners. No, no, you're not all Gentile sinners if you come into the covenant. The covenant of Moses. Now, I can. I don't believe this. These things are operative. This is the way they're using the language. You see what I'm saying? This is what they're talking about. So really, that one sinner is worth nine nine rights. One is in favor of the what we call the Gentile mission as opposed to the Palestinian pseudo-righteous people, scroll people. So we're beginning to see things here that are against that approach. That's what I'm trying to point out. Now, you are not called upon to believe anything. You're not, you don't have to, we're doing an academic exercise here. So here, you say, well, I believe in the doctrine as it's taught to me. Fine, believe, that's nothing wrong with that. What we're trying to say is, what do these people believe? Not what you believe. You don't have to agree with this. is not the word of God here necessarily. Any more than anything else may or may not. What we're trying to say is, what's their position? Who are they arguing with? What's their stance? What's the context of these documents? Isn't that what we're trying to do in this class? That's what I'm trying to do. So... I'm trying to begin to point out that there are little hints as we go that begin to make you think that we're in that context. Now the funny thing is that these bad people, these seekers after smooth things, the thing they do wrong is they have it wrong. They justify, if you want to say, the sinner and they condemn the righteous ones. But later on, if you move over here to column four, you'll find when they start talking about the sons of Zadok, the elect of Israel called by name in line three and four of the uh, of, uh, of uh, column four, and um, behold, this is the exact exposition of their names, according to their generation, the errors of their standing, the number of their suffering or trials, the years of their existence, and the precise exposition of their works. Again, works righteousness. This is a bit. The uh, text is a bit, um, you know, um, corrupted here, but. One assumes that it's saying they are the first men of holiness for whom or through whom God made atonement. God makes atonement through them, just like he does in Christianity through Jesus Christ. These sons of Zadok are like Jesus Christ. And what do they do? They justify the righteous and condemn the wicked. That's the proper way. You see, so this whole sermon or whatever is being set up and hinged on this double entendre of Justifying the righteous and condemning the wicked or justifying the wicked and condemning the righteous. The sons of Zadok have it right. They're the ones, and you know in Christianity too as we know, you start to look at the parallels, you can start really picking them up. Christianity 2, don't forget, Peter takes part in the last judgment. He has the keys to the kingdom. Peter tells you whether to go to the right or the left, etc. You go to heaven or hell or whatever. Well, that's what the sons of Zedekar to some extent do. Jesus justifies you. These people justify the righteous. But if they condemn the wicked, then they're part of the last judgment. Or something. And I think they are conceived in that, in, in that way here. The Habakkuk commentary will portray them as again, somewhat part of the last chapter. But we're getting, this stuff, the reason I had to read the Maccabean material doesn't sound anything like the Maccabean period. So if you're going to start putting this material in the second century BC, you know, you're really stretching what we've been um, looking at previously. Uh, Daniel and things like that are in the second century BC, but uh, this looks like a it's much more highly developed than that. You follow what I'm trying to say? Okay. So let's go back to column one. They justify the wicked, condemn the righteous. These who 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 did this? The seekers after smooth things, whoever they are. That's one of the people people that we're going to try to identify as we go along. And this is an infuriating code, isn't it? Why don't they just tell us? The enemies of the Maccabees, or the Herodians, or the Romans, or the Pharisees, or the Pauline Christians, or the James group, or someone. Why don't they tell us the truth? Why do they insist on using these infuriating circumlocutions, right? It's 
this infuriates me. I think if we keep our eye on the ball, like Mr. Um, Kerry said, don't take your eye off the ball, we should get to where we're going if we're lucky. We don't have any preconceptions, that will help too. So these people transgress the covenant. If you read the letter of James, you'll see at a very important point, he says, chapter 2, two uh, I think it's 4, 5, 6, and 7, he says, um, um, He who breaks one small point of the law is guilty of breaking the law. And he also is uh, big on the royal law according to the scripture, which is love your neighbor as yourself. We're going to find love your neighbor as yourself in this document. We're also going to find breaking one small point of the law in this document. Just express like the enemy, but it's here. Okay. So, they broke the law. We heard that. Oh, who's got a, let me see if I get a New Testament here quickly. I have one in the Look at if I can find it fast. Yeah, I gotta find it here. It's 210, I think. Yeah, I I gotta find the actual. And come on. Uh, I can't find it. Oh well, let's see. Oh yeah, it's over here someplace. Yeah, here it is. Thanks. My, uh, by the way, you want to look at some of the emphasis on doing here in James, if you look at the first chapter. Again, the antagonism to the rich. At line 12, he speaks of the crown of life the Lord has promised to those who love him. That's loving God. Uh, perfection, line 1, 4, be perfect and complete. So line 112, those who love him. Later on we're going to hear about the kingdom promised to those who love him. Loving God is the first commandment, the piety commandment. The second commandment is love your neighbor as yourself. It's a righteousness commandment. Where do we hear about that? In the teaching of John the Baptist and in Josephus' presentation of the teaching of the essence. Both of those twin commandments are there. John taught piety towards God and righteousness towards his fellow man, says Josephus chapter 18 the antiquity. And the Essenes group all their bathing and purity regulations under piety towards God and all their uh, relations with your fellow men under righteousness towards your fellow man or loving your neighbor as yourself. In any case, uh, led astray, line 16 we'll hear a lot about. And finally, we come to line 20 to the anger of man does not work the righteousness of God. We hear about God's righteousness. We've heard about this document already. Then it says, line 22, but be doers of the word and not hearers only. Because if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, here's the emphasis on doing, which we're going to find. That's twice. Three times, line 21, 25, but a doer of the work, now it's doing the work, that is the one that's blessed in his doing fourth times. And uh, also we're going to hear about someone whose tongue is not controlled, whose religion is worthless, line 26. That's just in the first chapter of James. Now in the second chapter we hear about the poor man, in even the Ebionite. Uh, that's in line 3. I'm just getting up to the righteousness command, showing you what's leading up to it. Chapter four, uh, line 5, my beloved brothers, hear this. Did not God choose the poor? In Hebrew, that would be Ebionim, the Ebionites. That's in early Christianity, the name for the James group of early Christians. They're called Ebionites in early Christian history. And we're going to hear that the scrolls call themselves Ebionim poor. 
that's a word in Hebrew. We haven't heard much of it. Certainly, we aren't hearing this in the Maccabean prayer. Ibian singular, Ibian in plural. Um, in any case, they're rich in faith and heirs to the kingdom which he promised to those who love him. Again, the piety commandment of loving God. So don't despise the poor man and the rich. Don't they oppress you? Don't they drag you before the judgment seat? That's the rich who are bad people here, not the Jews versus Romans here. Are not they the blasphemers, blaspheming the good name by which you were called? If you truly keep, here's the keeping idea that we'll get in the scrolls. Keeping is the definition of the sons of Zadok. Keeping the covenant is the definition of the sons of Zadok in the community rule. According to the scripture, you should love your neighbor as yourself. We'll see that in several places in the scroll. If you have partiality, particularly in the Damascus document, but if you have partiality, then you're doing well. But if you have partiality, you show partiality towards a person. Then you can uh, well be found guilty of being uh, of transgressing the law. Uh, if I, uh, I don't like the translation, then you do well if you love your neighbor again doing. But if you respect persons, then you are working sin and you are convicted by the law as breakers. So there's the, the breaker is the opposite of the keeper. For whoever keeps the whole law but stumbles on one small point, he becomes guilty of it all, or breaking it all. And so on, and so forth, and so on, and so forth. Then it goes on about Abraham, and uh, attacking some people who say in line 217, even so, uh, if someone says he has faith and I have works, I say, show me your faith from your works. So also, faith without works is dead and profits not. Uh, here's where the faith works argument. That's why I say you must use the word works where you see the word in the Dead Sea Scrolls. You can't uh, sort of avoid it. Say, Do you, uh, you want me to start reading this? He who has acts. And I, you know, and I, or he who has deeds. You see what I mean? You can't do that. If his works, his works. Um, show me your faith, part from your works, and I will show you my faith with from my works. You believe God is one, so do you do well. The demons also believe and tremble. Oh, you foolish man, or empty-headed man, line 20. Again, don't you know that faith uh, without works is dead? Mine, mine, and most others. This is an attack on the Pauline doctrine of salvation by faith alone. Its works working with faith. Was not our father Abraham declared righteous by works? And there is that justified by works. Let me see how it's put in the Greek. Was justified by works is the Greek. Having offered Isaac on the altar, that's a work, you see. That's not, um, not a faith, that's an act of works. You see that faith was working with works, and faith was made complete by the works. And Abraham believed in God, and so scripture was fulfilled. And this was counted for him as righteousness. That's what Paul talks about. And therefore he was called a friend of God. You see then that a man is declared just by works and not by faith alone. And again he says, just as the body apart from it is dead, so faith apart from works is also dead. So Abraham is called a friend of God. And, we, and Abraham is the is the uh, example cited, right? It's also cited by Paul in Galatians and Romans as a part of this debate between Paul and James. So those are the passages it's all based on. So guess what's going to happen? We're going to come in on Abraham by the time we get to column six, and he's going to be called the friend of God as well. In fact, I think it's going to be sooner than that. It's going to be in column three. We're going to come upon him very, 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 very quickly. And um, uh, we're going to see similar concepts being uh, played with here. Not familiar vocabulary, but similar concepts. 
Now, if you are not aware of these splits in early Christianity, which is, again, I break with the Jewish colleagues who are not familiar with these things, so if they don't know these things, how are they going to evaluate if they're here or not? And if we have Christian scholars who are not prepared to acknowledge such things exist, how are they going to uh, you know, see through to these things? And who else is doing Dead Sea Scrolls studies in most of the books that you read? But usually believing Jews or believing Christians of one kind or another. And uh, I don't think they can do good Dead Sea Scrolls studies unless they set their belief aside and try to look and see what's uh, the scholarship first. Now, most people in divinity schools are not able to do that. Now, some people may be able to do that. And they say they're able to do it, but I've not met many who do. I may be wrong. Let's go on. So, they broke the law and transgressed the covenant. I find that in the letter of James. But they also banded together against the soul of the righteous one. Now, people like Vermesh put in their translation, the righteous meaning many, because they don't want to admit that it's one righteous one. Now, it can be many. Just like the people who say in the letter of James, uh, the rich condemn the righteous, and then they'll translate it. I'll read it to you. I've done it before, but I'll do it again quickly for you. Uh, this is when the letter of James gets very aggressive and quite apocalyptic, very much like the scrolls, and condemning the rich. Come rich, line chapter 5, weep, power with your miseries. That, the Damascus document is against the rich too. Your riches are all rotted, your clothes are moth eaten, your gold and silver has been eaten away, your rust is a witness against you, you shall eat your flesh like fire, you have heaped up treasure in the last days. Last days will be in the come run uh, Pesherim commentaries. But look, the wages of the workers who harvested your fields cry out to it, which you have held back, and the cries have reached the ears of the Lord God of hosts. We're going to hear about the Lord God of hosts in the scrolls. You live pleasure. You nourish your hearts. You condemn and kill the just or the righteous. Now some will say the righteous won. And others will say the righteous or the just. They offered you no resistance depending on what translation you have. Yes, but the Greek does not say they. It says he. So we're talking about Condemning the righteous one, just like we just got in the letter of James earlier. That earlier chapters of the letter of James. Uh, he did not resist you, therefore, brothers, be patient of the coming of the Lord. See the farmer waits uh, on early rain and late rain, and be patient, make your heart strong, for the coming of the Lord is approaching. You see, when the Lord is coming, he, the judge is at the door, he stands ready. In any case, the implication is there's going to be some vengeance taken for the condemnation of the just one. This is singular here, but the translation by people who don't want to admit that this is talking about someone like Jesus here just makes it general, the righteous plural. But that's not what it says. It says, he offered you no resistance. So it's singular. How many have they offered you no resistance in their <coughs> translations? Well, if you have a dump book now, uh, five six, James, uh, 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 James five six. A lot of translations have. Yeah, well, that's wrong. It's in the Greek. It's him. So you see, they're just shading it. King James has he. Yeah, well, that's accurate. Okay. So anyway, what I'm trying to say is that these are the things that are really important here. And so here, it's the same here. They pursued the soul of the righteous. You see, that's why I brought it up. It's the same thing. It's the righteous one again, or is it the righteous? Well, in Hebrew, the usage is singular, righteous one. So it is not plural. The plural is the walkers in perfection. When they want to talk about plural, they'll talk about plural. The walkers in perfection are the companions of the righteous one. And by the way, the righteous one in the letter of James is a Jesus-like figure. The righteous one here is the teacher of righteousness type figure. So we're getting a picture of someone pursued the righteous one. 
They banded together the soul, meaning it's really the life or the being. In other words, it looks like an attack unto death or an attempt to kill. And all and against all the walkers in perfection, perfection, abominating, execrating, hating, whatever it is, their being, their soul, or loathing. I don't care what translation you have here. And they pursued them with the sword. So these people, these supposed Pharisees, aren't, or these smooth seekers up the smooth things, whatever they are, are uh, pretty aggressive. They are, uh, they pursue with the sword and divide, or rejoice in the division of the people, and therefore the wrath of God was kindled against their entire congregation, chapter two or column two, right? Now, congregation, you have to understand is a word in Hebrew that means assembly, and in Greek assembly means church. <laughs> so congregation can mean their church. I know it's a stretch in English because the church doesn't sound like congregation. But in Greek, assembly is ecclesia, and in English, ecclesia is church. So that's where we get church from. Depends what language you're using. So I'm not saying this means church, I'm just saying when do we see the word <coughs> congregation? Don't think it's such an alien thing. And when the James party is talked about in the book of Acts, we speak about the assembly of the, uh, the, uh, the assembly of elders. The presbyteroi is talked about. Yeah? The assembly. In chapter 21 of Acts, Paul goes up before the assembly led by James. James is the leader of the assembly. He's called to account. There's no Peter around by this point. Well, there is. But he's supposed to have fled. And the other James is dead, so we know who it is in chapter 21. And we can talk about, look in your New Testaments at some point, and look at all the time the word assembly or church is used. Anyway, congregation is a similar word. Maybe the congregation, it may not. Devastating all their multitude. And their works were unclean or polluted before him, God. And now listen to us. So that's the end of that presentation. We're changing gears now. So that's a pretty nasty picture. Someone who will remove the boundary markers, condemn the righteous, a root of planting was planted, and these people uh, hated the walkers in perfection, or those walking in. I say walkers in perfection because that's not what the Hebrew actually reads. It's a noun. A plural noun. Walker, it doesn't say walking in perfection. It doesn't say though. It says walkers in perfection. Just like keepers. Not those keeping keepers of the covenant. Doers. Be a doer of the word, Paul uh, James said. Remember? We're going to hear about the doers. Doers is going to be an expression used in the Habakkuk commentary. It's going to come up and it's going to be very important. It'll be a key word in the Habakkuk commentary. Be a doer, not a breaker. These are all consistent ideas. Okay. So listen to me, all you went to the covenant. We're going to find out what covenant that is. It's going to be by, chapter, by column six. It's going to be called the new covenant in the land of Damascus. It's not just any old covenant, it's the new covenant. Now the new covenant in the New Testament is the name for early Christianity in Palestine. And the, the New Testament actually means new covenant. This is the new covenant in my blood, Jesus says at the Last Supper. You know, which was poured out for the many. This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Right? How many have heard of that one? Well, most people have been to church and heard of that one. So this is the new covenant land of Damascus. So you say, oh, it's not the same thing. You want to bet? I mean, it doesn't look like the same thing. But I'm not sure it isn't the same thing. You say, well, it can be. It means something entirely different. Yes, it's been reinterpreted differently. This is the native Palestinian interpretation that we're reading here. Now, what it became later overseas is maybe or totally not connected to it, it may be connected to it. In my forthcoming work that Christine is helping me uh, make presentable to the uh, publishers and uh, readable, um, I have uh, a way of showing that the two are inter integrally related. I also have it in the James book if you look carefully enough if you have that book. Anyway, we're going to hear about the new covenant land of Damascus in columns 6 and 8. This is an incredible document. What you're reading here is really the book of Acts of the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's 
not like the Book of Acts, but it serves the same purpose. It tells you about the origins of the community in an historical, homiletic, if you like, presentation. A bit preaching and a bit, and a bit historical. I will unstop your ears. Remember, even in the Gospels, as Jesus presented, he, he unstops a deaf mute person's ears. I don't know if you know that particular episode in the Gospels. So what's that got to do with it? Oh, I think all these things are being parodied in the Gospels. When I see a Hebrew document saying, unstop your ears, then Jesus does a miracle and unstops someone's ears. In any case, that's not proof. I'm just saying, watch those usages. They're there. I think your translation might say open in the year. It doesn't matter, open or, of course we know, or else Jesus also says in the Gospels, he who has ears, let him hear. Meaning, look, listen up. I'm not saying exactly what you think I'm saying. I'm saying, you know, look at the inner meaning of what I'm saying. He who has ears, let him hear. How many have heard that before? Yeah, unstop your ears. Totally powerful. Concerning now the ways of the wicked, God loves knowledge, wisdom, good counsel. He places before him uh, discernment and knowledge ministered to him. <coughs> An overwhelming wrath with great sheets of fire in which all the angels of destruction are upon those who turn aside from the way or the turner, actually it's the turners aside from the way. When you see those who do something, someone's translating a, a, an actual verbal noun. It's really, so I like to keep the original Hebrew turners aside from it. It's, a, it's a, an actual noun. So now these people are not full of brotherly love for their enemies, are they? That there's no inclination here to love your enemy, is there? No, these people hate their enemies. They love the righteous, they hate the wicked. And that's, a, that's their mindset. And I'm afraid, to my mind, that's a Palestinian mindset. When you get into things like loving your enemies, you're almost into a Socratic Neoplatonic world. Uh, a Mediterranean Hellenistic world. Where uh, sophistication has given way to vengeance. And uh, people have learned to, you know, reinterpret things in a different way. But whether a person walked around the countryside of Palestine saying those things would be something we'd have to argue about. We can't do it in this class. But this, whatever you think about the new doctrine may or may not be, this is very Middle Eastern. It's also, Plato says, most people think justice is helping your friends and hurting your enemies. He says that in the Republic. How many have read the Republic? He says that. He says helping your friends and hurting Yeah. Loving your friends and hating your enemies. That's what most people think justice is. But Plato's going to teach a higher justice. So does Christianity as it moves through Neoplatonism. In the Gospel of John, we definitely have a Neoplatonic Gospel. I mean, if you don't know what Neoplatonism is, it's a doctrine that developed out of Plato and became very religious in the Greek, Hellenistic, Alexandrian culture sphere in Egypt, particularly. And the um, Gospel of John has many concepts in common with those ideologies. But let me leave that aside. It's not Palestinian. Uh, this is. So, good counsel, discernment, knowledge to those who minister to him. You know, um, there's a group up here of Jewish religious people who dress in black garments and are very pious, and you may have seen them. They're called Hasidim. How many have seen them? Uh, they have little trucks that go around where they take the children to school and stuff like that. And if you see on the side of the truck, it sometimes says Chabad, C-H-A-B-A-D, which is the name, their name for their movement, the Chabad movement. Well, that's an acronym. That's an acronym of three things. Chakma, wisdom, Bina, understanding, and uh, Da'at, knowledge. Chabad, C-H-B-D. And here you have it here. God loves Dot, Chokhmah, and Bina. All the three things that they've combined into an acronym are already here in this document. If you look at the Hebrew, that's what's there in the Hebrew. So basically, you even have the acronym of Chabad right here. I haven't 
told anyone from above that that's true because they wouldn't understand what I'm talking about, but in any case, it is. In any case, they ministered to him, such people. Uh, he's long-suffering and with abundant forgiveness for those and atones for the penitence of or from sin. You have some other language, I hope? Now, the penitence of or from sin are going to be very important because the penitence are going to be another important concept in the Damascus document. We're going to find it in the discussion of who the priests are that go out in the wilderness with the sons of Zadok. It's going to say, and the, uh, you know, and the, the penitents, we're going to find out, are you go out with, are the priests, supposedly, but not a normative definition of priest. That's going to be in column four here if we ever get to it. I hope we do. I'm trying to go as fast as I can here. This is very complicated stuff. So one of the public has got a lot of trouble with it and just gives up and lets the scholar tell them what to think. Which is why I always try to let the public in on the documents so they can make up their own determination whether the scholars have it right. Because I mean, be, you know, we had the pollers tell us that uh, Kerry won the election and the pollsters were all wrong. So very often the scholars are all, uh, don't even know what they're talking about. Anyway, that's the one side. But power, might, great flaming wrath with sheets of fire, all the angels of destruction. We're going to hear the similar Im imagery in the community rule where there are two ways, light and dark good and evil, and uh, they're going to curse the people who are walking in the evil way. It'll be in the community rule of the first four chapters. It's the next document we're going to read. Uh, and the abominators, if you like, or despisers or blasphemers of the law, these people, they, they shall not have any remnant or survival. We're going to wipe them all out. This is a little blood curdling. This is not friendly. These are not peaceful Essenes. They may, I know scholars say these are Essenes and they're very peaceful. No, these are not peaceful people. They're peaceful in what they do. They may not be jumping on you right away, but they're not wishing you well. Does anyone disagree with that point? No, no backsliders are being wished well. <laughs> the, the contrary, there shall be no remnant or survivor to them because before thou, here's a kind of uh, pre-existence or predestination. Listen to this, because before the world ever was, or in the beginning, if you have that, God chose them not. And before they were established, he knew their works. They have works too, but they're evil works. And he abominated their generations. Guess what? I put it in italics. On account of blood. What kind of blood? Well, we'll see. Who knows about early Christianity? This is the new covenant, the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Drink this, etc. Drink my blood, eat my body, etc., 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 etc. That would go nowhere here. That would just be dead stop here. That would only go in a Hellenistic world. In a Pauline, and Paul's the first person who announced it in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 where he's talking about things sacrificed to idols. But in the book of Acts, as we have it, in chapter 15, if you know the book of Acts, James is presented as having this council where Paul comes to give the gospel that he's preaching overseas. And uh, James rules that, okay, if you want to teach to the non-Jews this presentation that you have of Christ, then they must at least observe the following three things. Abstain or keep away from, and in Hebrew that is based on the root Nazar, Nazarite, keep away. We'll have it here three times, and I show it to you in this document, keep away from. Keep away from, I can't remember, blood. We just had that one right here. Um, blood, fornication, and things sacrificed to idols and strangled things. Strangled things is going to be carrying. We'll find out in other documents. Things that uh, died from animals. Strangling them in the throat. And there's other renditions that make that clear. Particularly in the pseudo <coughs> literature. But 
writers of Acts are not too familiar with that. Anyway, Paul debates at least two of those in the 1 Corinthians. Particular things sacrificed to idols. It's going to be very important. And things sacrificed to idols, he's going to end up with that an idol is nothing in the world, and these people are making trouble over nothing, and that you can eat anything in the butcher shops, and all things are lawful to me. If you want to read all this, read chapters 8, 9, 10, 11 of 1 Corinthians. Anyway, keep away from blood is part of James' instructions to overseas community. Now, this group has a horror of blood. They say that he abominated all their generation on account of blood, meaning the consumption of blood, obviously, or even the shedding of blood, both could be. Later, we're going to hear sleeping with women in the blood of their period is forbidden. Could be fornicating in blood. Now, we think of these things nowadays as stupid. But you see, also nowadays, we're beginning to realize that blood is a frightening thing. And since the AIDS epidemic and things like that, you go to the dentist and people put on rubber gloves when they even touch your teeth. People have a horror, a fear of blood. You say, well, menstrual blood, why would that bother anyone? Well, since the coming of AIDS, even that could be kind of frightening maybe to some people. Who knows? I don't know if there's uh, AIDS in that sort of uh, um, uh, effusion. I don't know anything about it. I mean, I'm not a doctor. But I think that these things in ancient times, before all this, in the Hebrews, they knew these things were dangerous, but didn't know why or how, so they put taboos on a lot of things. And that's why I think they knew that, uh, they, they knew there were people who were doing, getting involved in this kind of thing, then came down with illnesses and stuff. So they just made general laws, you know. Don't consume, as Noah says, pour the blood out. Don't consume things with blood. Now they're saying that we started the AIDS epidemic from eating monkeys in Equatorial Africa. I don't know. Uh, but don't eat blood. Don't sleep with women in their periods. People in the period should be set aside, you know, from the camp till the blood ceases and so on. Ritual immersion after these things. Don't mix uh, the, et cetera, et cetera. Don't boil a kid in its mother's milk. All kinds of regulations develop. Some reasonable, some maybe not so reasonable. And they were very sophisticated in the way they categorized things. For instance, they said the only the rabbis and the uh, I think uh, I don't know I think it's in the book of um, Leviticus only it may not be there but I think it is unless it's just in the Talmud only eat fish swimming things with fins and scales. That's very sophisticated classification. Anyone in biology will know that. Meaning you know it had to be a fresh swimming fish. It couldn't be a bottom feeder, like flounders or eels. And we know that in the Nile, Velarsi and a lot of those diseases came from those bottom feeding uh, creatures of that kind. It can't be mollusks and stuff like that. And we know that you get hepatitis and everything from those things if they're not uh, pr preserved well and so on. So they tried to express this thing the way they could. So they put blanket kind of, you know, blanket taboos on this sort of thing. Uh, and uh, there was some insight to that. Now, okay, by this time, they're just as part of the law of Moses. Uh, but, you know, you just can't have someone like Paul come along and say, okay, drink the blood, it's fine. Or eat anything in the butcher shop, that's it. Don't make problems over food, you know, and so on and so forth. Uh, you know, or Jesus saying, don't wash your hands before you eat. In the, uh, in, in, in the Gospels, and the Gospel of Mark says, he said these things declaring all foods clean and so on and so forth. Yeah, fine, but you can say that, but that's more Roman Hellenistic practice aimed at the Gentile mission that is not going to fly in Palestine any more than today you, it would fly in an Islamic world. So, you know, you just have to understand that to us they seem as unreasonable, stubborn people, but they're already brought up on this. We have to put ourselves in their minds and look, I eat blood. I eat shrimp, I eat lobster, I eat pork, I do all these things. But So I'm not trying to shove the Lord on anyone's throat, but I can understand the people who were observing. You understand? That's what we need is some sympathy, not just, uh, we have to understand where they're coming from. So this is the first thing. Blood is forbidden, absolutely. So the Pauline presentation of Christ, even though it's only symbolic, is never going to go down in Palestine. Now, maybe among people willing to abandon this, but uh, there's very few people who are going to do that. You can only go down to Ireland, Haiti, uh, maybe down in uh, 
South Sea Islands or some other place where people are not thinking about these things. And that's where it was successful, it went everywhere. You say, well, how come the Jews are so stubborn? Well, couldn't, they couldn't go there because they couldn't deal with it. They would have to abandon their whole heritage to deal with it. Right or wrong, I'm not saying that Paul isn't right or who is right or wrong. I'm just saying that's what we have here. So this is, I think, an anti-Pauline group. Now, it may not be that Paul is their opponent, but they certainly wouldn't support it. We're talking about the new covenant. It's not going to be in the blood of Christ. It's going to be in the land of Damascus. So in any case, on account of blood, and he hid his face until they were consumed, for he knew the years of their standing, the numbers of their precise determination. We're talking about all these evil people. And in all of these generations, he raised up himself men called by name, so a remnant might remain, Ezekiel talks about the remnant, and fill the face with their seed. And he made known to them by the hand of his Messiah. Now, some of these translations put his anointed one. But the usage is Messiah. That's what it says Messiah. It doesn't say anointed one necessarily. If you're saying anointed one, it's because you don't want people to confuse this with Jesus the Messiah. Well, you know, it's his Messiah. It may not be his only Messiah, but it's his Messiah. And it's singular. Um, and uh, let's see. By the hand of his Messiah. I got a problem here with this text. Let me see what it actually is written in Hebrew here. What's that? 212. 212. Uh Moshihu, And then it speaks about his Holy Spirit, and it's not clear what's missing in the text. There's something missing, and it's not doing very well at the text. Uh, his Messiah, his Holy Spirit are put in conjunction with each other. But those are things we know about in Christianity. Again, Holy Spirit we know about, right? Don't, don't put Spirit of Holiness because it's Holy Spirit. There's no difference. And if you put Spirit of Holiness, you're trying to get people away from making an association. You put anointed one and then Spirit of Holiness, well, you're in another universe. But if you go back to our vocabulary, put Messiah and Holy Spirit, then we know what he's talking about. And he or it is truth. Now, Vermesh leaves all this out. Why does it leave all this out? Ah, because it's inconvenient to him. But it's there. And it's singular. And that's inconvenient to him, too, because he's already put it anointed ones plural, I think, hasn't he? Because I don't have Vermesh in front of me. What has he got there? Anointed ones plural? Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. Then, how does that, then no wonder it leaves out the, uh, the next line. And he or it is true. It doesn't say they are true. And in the explanation of his, and it says his, not theirs, name, their names are to be found. He leaves all that out. He just puts dot, dot, dot. I'm not even sure he put dot, dot, dot. Does he put dot, dot, dot there? He proclaimed the truth to them. He proclaimed the truth to them? Well, that's a new translation, which he didn't used to have, but in the older translation he had, he had it. He just put dot, dot, dot. In any case, uh, he's been, I guess, responding to criticism. Uh, I have an older, I think have an older translation of this here. Let's see if I can get it here. Maybe the truth is part of what he had, but he left out the other part. Uh, the point I'm trying to make is you, you have to give the whole text. We may not understand the text, but you can't play uh, loose with the text. Otherwise, you're not being fair to your readers. Uh, let's see. This is column two. Um... Let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. Okay, and he made known his Holy Spirit to them by the hand of his anointed ones. He proclaimed the truth to them. But those whom he hated, ah, oh, I see, he proclaimed the truth and then in parentheses to them. Right. So he's got that, but he's left out all this other stuff. Now let's go back here to what he's left out. And this is in the actual Hebrew. Uh, he made known to them by the hand of his Messiah, his Holy Spirit. Okay, so he, the, the Messiah is revealing the Holy Spirit. Okay, that, that's probably fine. Yes, but then, uh, and, he, and he proclaimed the truth to them is not there. And it is truth, or he is truth. 
And then another point, the next line is not there in his thing. And in the explanation of his names, their names are to be found. So all that is left out because of the singulars, the singular Messiah. That's how I see it. See, that's, that sentence is totally left out, isn't it? This, uh, and in the explanation of, their, of his name, singular, or its name, if you prefer, if it's Holy Spirit, I don't know which, I think it's his name, their name. Uh, and uh, he's, he doesn't have them. any kids. And those whom he hated, he let us He just picks up those whom he hated, he let us I'm not trying to just sing them out. But you have to put everything in here. I don't know what it means, but it is a singular Messiah that is being spoken of there. Past, present, future is not easy to say. Okay. And now, my sons, listen to me and I shall uncover your eyes. Okay, we heard on stop your ears, now we have uncover your eyes. He who has eyes, let him see. I think at one point in one of the Gospels and these miracles Jesus does, he spits in someone's eyes. Let's him see. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I don't react very positively to this spitting in people's eyes much. I don't think you particularly want someone to spit in your eye, but maybe it'll work. Anyway. I don't think, see, this is, I think that's really being written by people far away from the events in question. I don't blame anyone for that. I just think that our problem is we take what's literature as history, as I've said, and we, we, we're not willing to criticize because it's so sacred to everybody, and we're, we're frightened to, to express a, a, a worry or a concern that there may not be, that, that this may not be totally accurate. Okay, but we're not worried here, so we can continue with this. I'll uncover your eyes so you can see and understand the works of God. Ah, the works again. So you may choose what pleases him and reject that which he hates in order that you can walk in perfection. The walkers in perfection. We have an idea of perfection, of walking in perfection. And uh, we're going to hear that in other uh, documents. So these ideas go from document to document, which is why I constantly say this is the literature of a movement. These ideas go from go from one document to the next, and they um, and they uh, uh, are consistent. So you, this is not like an assortment of any type of literature. This is the literature of one orientation. You know, Jesus says in the Scripture, "Be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect," according to the Sermon on the Mount. So you have a perfection idea uh, uh, idea there. Paul will talk in two Corinthians about. Uh, of doing these things in the perfection of holiness. We'll hear about the perfection of holiness in this doc document and in the community rule. Uh, unless your righteousness exceeds the scribes and the Pharisees, in the same Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, you shall no wise enter the kingdom of heaven. So we have a, a higher righteousness ideal, perfection ideal, and we have all these things here, plus the way ideal. Anyway, that you can walk in all his ways and not follow the thoughts of sinful imagination or fornicating eyes. Okay, that's the end of that. New, new thought. Now, many in the past have gone astray. That's an important word, going astray. We heard about it, going astray in the wilderness without a way. And now this is, the whole history of Israel is going to be presented to you. And mighty warriors stumbled in these things from ancient times until now. So now the sermon is going to be the history of Israel. They're all taught in a covert way, but Abraham is going to be mentioned now momentarily. And the reason these people fell is because they walked in stubbornness of heart. The watchers of heaven fell. I'll tell you about that after the break. I want to just get to the end of this section. They were caught in them because they did not keep the commandments of God. Oh, we've heard about keeping, being a keeper in the letter of James. Keep the commandments of God. That's why they fell. And their sons, because these were the giants on the earth that spoken of in the book of Genesis whose height was like cedar trees, and their bodies were like mountains. They fell, and all flesh was dry on the land after the, uh, after the uh, giants on the earth in the uh, book of Genesis. What happens? The sons of God have intercourse with the daughters of men, and then God wipes out what? All flesh on the earth, and that's what we're having here. And all flesh which was on dry land perished, and they were as if they had never been. And in their doing according to their own will, they did their own will. They didn't keep the commandments of their maker. 
Therefore, his wrath was kindled against them. And then we know in column three that we're talking about the flood because we start speaking about the sons of Noah. So, starting there in uh, in in in, um, in uh, line sixteen of column two, we're now getting a presentation of the whole history of Israel. I'll pick up after the break. Okay. I'm hurrying because I just want to get this stuff done in a way that uh, you guys can read it yourself.